Welcome to another scriptural study. In this study, we will be researching a scriptural question if there is a difference of being loving and or just nice. As always, keep your computer monitors on full screen. And please, stop the video at any time to further focus on the scriptural passages and associated information. How many of us would say that there is no difference in being loving and being nice, that they're one in the same? But is this true from a scriptural standpoint, let alone a simple etymological dictionary word search? Here are the three categories of this scriptural study video. So, what is love? Believe it or not, the world and its definition of love is far different than the definition of what love is in the scripture. A basic dictionary search reveals the following information on the word love from a worldly point of view. In this world, a dictionary will state that love is associated to a strong affection out of kinship or personal ties as in the maternal love for a child. The Greeks called this agape, which is an unconditional love, like the strong love of a mother for a child. The Merriam-Webster's Dictionary further shares that love is an attraction based on sexual desire. The Greeks utilized the word eros to describe this type of sexual passion, which we now know historically was for all forms of sexual desire, based on the multitudes of alternative lifestyles the ancient Greek society accepted, which included bestiality. It's alarming how people have been so easily deceived into thinking society today is progressing, when in fact it's just going back to what it practiced in the past, and why many who study history and archaeology know that the more things change, the more they stay the same. The world's definition of love also includes an affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interests like a love for old schoolmates. Benevolence meaning a disposition to do good, uh, an act of kindness, a generous gift. More on this later. The worldly view of love also shares that it is a warm attachment and or enthusiasm, like a devotion to something, as in the love of the sea. The worldly view of love is also defined as in an object of attachment, devotion, and or admiration of an activity, as in sports with the love of baseball. And notice the detail in the definition. Baseball was his first love. More on this later. Love, from a world's dictionary view, is often used as a term of endearment for a beloved person. The worldly definition then states that love can be an unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another, but then awkwardly shares a fatherly concern of God for humankind and a person's adoration of God. Why is this so awkward? Because each individual and their personal world religious view about God is different, isn't it? But the world persists in the lie that they can all coexist together when in fact history has proven the opposite. Because the world's daily news media does indeed report that each individual confirms that their world religion view has an individual god and her gods, which are not the same. The Greeks defined their gods as mythical. And why? Dictionaries define the non-scriptural title god as a word which is common to Teutonic tongues as it was applied to all man-made heathen deities. Even encyclopedias confirm that the word God is not a name and or proper title for the Almighty One in Scripture, 
but rather is only a personal object of religious worship applied to all those super man-made human beings of the heathen mythologies. Isn't it ironic that the world and all of its world religions have consciously decided to utilize a man-made title which has nothing to do with the loving Almighty One of Scripture? as compared to the true scriptural name for the Father, which is Yahuwah, and literally means, I am he that is self-existent. Which is certainly telling, isn't it? And thus why the world's dictionary view on the word love, as crazy as it seems, defines it with a Greek mythical man-made deity known as Cupid. And even more insane as the Greek mythological deity known as Eros. And thus why, for the Greeks, was one of their six loves, which included the sexual practice of being lewd, playfully, and in many cases openly in public, just as demonstrated today. Indeed, the more that things change, the more they stay the same. Notice as well, the world's dictionary definition provides the term personification of love. The word personification is defined by an individual and or individuals attributing a personal nature and or human characteristic to something non-human, as in the case of the man-made deities of Cupid and or Eros, which are not real, as they are non-human. Personification is known as an incorrect form of love because it happens when someone equates their self-worth and or the worth of another human being to something non-human. And why 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 states what it does in regards to the love of money being the root of all evil. Because personifying money as something with human qualities and or characteristics leads to all kinds of evil associated with many pains. Isn't it sad that in today's day and age, a corporation has more legal rights than a human being because we have allowed the world to personify things that are not human? And the final definition from a world's view on love is the sexual embrace known as copulation, which is nothing other than sexual intercourse. Many are amazed that the final word for love for the Greeks was known as philosia, which is about the love of self, and are known as self-love. But wait a minute. Isn't it true that many share that we make a living by what we get, but make a life by what we give? Is it true then that true love knows no bargains? As some say, true love is like one-way traffic because it only gives. So why then do these dictionaries from the world share that the definition of love demonstrates how to get rather than give, let alone provide any details on how to actually love someone else through giving. So, the answer for that question can be found in the scriptures, because, as we can see, the world dictionary definitions are indeed found wanting. Most of us are introduced to the scriptural meaning of love at weddings. You know, the passages from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 through 8, where it states, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude or self-seeking, and is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. It always protects, always hopes, always perseveres, and that love never fails. But wait a minute, you might say. Isn't the divorce failure rate well over 50% worldwide, let alone up to 70% in some countries? 
If love never fails, why do we have this? Is there a missing link scripturally? Well, let's go to the greatest teacher and our only teacher, the Word himself, Yahushua the Messiah, to find out what he stated about what love is and how to do it. It comes as no surprise, then, that we learn that the Almighty Father, Yahuwah himself, taught his Son, the Messiah, Yahushua, what true love is. The Almighty One so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but possess everlasting life. No taking here, just giving. Is this why the Messiah Yahushua taught that if we stay in his commands, we shall stay in his love, just as he guarded his father's commands and thus stayed in his father's love? And that if we indeed love the father, we would guard his commands because they are not heavy. The Messiah Yahushua determined what true love was by stating that his true brothers, sisters, and mother were the ones who did the desire of his father, which are the commands. The Messiah Yahushua provides further guidance on how to do them by sharing that first and foremost we shall love Yahuwah, the Almighty One, with all our being, with all of our minds, as this is the first and greatest commandment, which the first four commands provide us the direction on how to do this. Imagine the benefits if all people and their families did these four commandments on earth. Again, this is who the Messiah, Yahushua, stated his true family was. The second greatest command states you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and on these two commands hang all the Torah and the prophets. The last six commandments share how we can love our neighbor as ourselves. Imagine the benefits if all people and their families did these remaining commandments on earth. The word also explains what the opposite of true love is, and thus provides 10 things that can contribute to anyone losing their inheritance as the Almighty Father in Heaven, Yahuwah Himself, wants no one to perish but possess everlasting life. Because Yahuwah calls us to freedom, and to utilize this freedom He has given us not for occasions of the flesh but rather to utilize this freedom to serve one another through love. The Ten Commandments are the ways to serve through love. While the Ten Ways to Serve Occasions of the Flesh are the path on how to lose your inheritance. And thus why true love never fails. But when occasions of the flesh are introduced, the failure rate skyrockets. And why true love does not have a missing link scripturally. Because the Ten Commandments, just as the Messiah Yahushua stated, are how we are to utilize the freedom given to us to serve one another through love. Because the dictionary definition of the world for love is about utilizing your freedom to get. While scriptural love is about utilizing our freedom to give. The world's view and definition of love has blinders on it. And thus does not provide the how-tos on how to love. While the scriptures provide great detail and guidance on how to truly love. But wait, you might say, as you may now be asking, why is this so? So, the next question in this scriptural study is this. What is it to be nice? 
as we have seen, there is a significant difference in the scriptural definition of love as compared to the world's definition of love. Does this immense difference with love demonstrate why and what an individual in this world will support and or even promote? The word nice is an adjective and in most cases defines its association to the word nice as being good. We all have heard the sayings which state, as long as I'm a good person and I do things from the heart, that's all that matters. But look what happened when a certain ruler called the Messiah a good teacher to find out what he must do to inherit everlasting life. The Messiah, Yahushua, immediately responded by saying, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one. And he was referring to the Almighty Father, Yahuwah. The Messiah, Yahushua, then further ensures the individual understands what he must do to inherit everlasting life by pointing him to his Father's commands. So, the question is this. Are the people that take the liberty to call themselves good, are they loving or just nice? And can we truly know by what they promote and or support? And does this question apply to all of us? Another characteristic and or definition of being nice is the word agreeable. An agreeable person is always ready and or willing to agree or consent to being in harmony in order to be accepted by everyone. And thus why agreeable people scripturally are known as friends of the world. But scripturally, being a friend of the world makes yourself an enemy of the almighty Yahuwah himself. But why? Isn't it true that nice, agreeable people that are friends with the world support and promote the ten ways to lose your inheritance rather than the ten ways to secure it? Another definition of the word nice is the word subtle. Regrettably, the definition of the word subtle can remind us of human government in which its politicians become delicately elusive, obscure, perceptive, and refined. They can be known as subtle craftsmen because they must maneuver in the world cunningly and thus at times operate in an insidious, artful, crafty manner. As a result, entire countries and continents end up worshipping at the feet of the world's church of political correctness and practice the doctrines of silent approval in which where no one sees, hears, and or speaks of the evils that exist. And there are many examples that highlight the pain that has been caused due to what is known as silent approval, which is known in some world organizations that are part of the political governments of the world as tacit, which is an action expressed and are carried out without words or speech, which is implied or indicated by an act of silence. History has proven time and time again that being nice with a subtle approach always attracts political correctness and thus hides the evils that come from silent approval. Could this be why nice, subtle people in a tacit approach, support and promote the 10 ways to lose your inheritance rather than the 10 ways to secure it. Even the synonyms for the word nice is telling. Let's look at the word likable. Yes, once again, it is defined as agreeable, in which we have already covered. 
let alone what it means from a scriptural standpoint. And take a look at the characteristics of the words liked and liking. It refers to feeling an attraction towards something, to take pleasure in something, and then utilizes the example of enjoying baseball. Sound familiar? It should, because as we have already reviewed, this is the same definition from the world in its dictionaries for love, let alone first love. But, as we can plainly see, the scripture reveals that our first love must not be something worldly, but rather spiritually. And if we happen to lose our first and true love, it immediately shares how to regain it by pointing us back at what we must choose. The scriptural process of love ensures an individual does not sit on the fence. The world's process of just being nice allows an individual to sit on the fence. Because even when an individual chooses not to decide the word reveals that the individual in question still indeed has made a choice. Scripturally, there is no option to be lukewarm. You are either hot or cold when it comes to this scriptural subject matter, just as the book of Revelation chapter 3 verses 13 through 16 easily reveal. Whether we are loving and are just nice from a worldly standpoint, The scripture, the word itself, will reveal what each of us chose. And the word will prove if we loved that choice. The next three characteristics of being liked and or liking something all revolve around what is defined as self-love, which is a regard for one's own well-being and happiness. Which, if we recall, was the word philosia, or self-love, for the Greeks. In fact, out of the six Greek words for love, three of the six were all defining different forms of self-love. As compared to the nine world dictionary examples presented here, of which seven of the nine are all defining different forms of self-love. What does this mean? So, when the world supports and promotes being nice through the process of the ten ways which can contribute to you losing your inheritance, you're actually attempting to get something for yourself. This is a form of self-love. As compared to the scripture supporting and promoting 10 ways to secure your inheritance because in this process you are always involved in giving something to someone else. In fact, the original scriptural three-letter root word in Hebrew for love is ahava, as the original scriptural language was known as the clean lip, which is read from right to left. The first letter of the word love is the first letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet, in which we get the English word alphabet. And this letter, the Aleph, has a numerical value of 1. The second letter in the Hebraic three-letter root word for love is the He. And the definition of this letter means to give. The third letter in this root word is known as the letter Bet, and is the second letter of the Hebraic alphabet, and has a numerical value of 2. So, when we put all of this together, we get the following. When one gives to two and or another, and this original three-letter root word has a fourth letter today, and is another hey, which again is defined as giving. Put this all together, and as we can see, it shares that when one gives to two and or another, they give scriptural love. 
and why the Messiah, Yahushua, shared that true love is about the commandments. Thus why the Messiah, Yahushua, clarified who and why his true family were the ones that did the desire of his father. Yes, the spiritual and scriptural process of understanding if we are loving and are just nice reveals if we indeed chose love and if we indeed love our choice. And truly reveals if we utilized our freedom to love and as such serve one another. Through the commandments to support and or promote scriptural love or utilized our freedoms to choose to be just nice in order to support and or promote what the world does with occasions of the flesh. And finally, the definition of likable states that it is having qualities that bring favorable regard and the individual could be considered a likable character. Think of this definition as it relates with and to the advent of Facebook and this worldwide online communication tool where the user is motivated electronically in an automated fashion to be liked on each and every post which was consciously designed to give the user a positive boost and or an addictive fix of self-esteem. This online drug was consciously designed to be addictive. And the multitudes of medical scientific studies are indeed revealing that this online drug has serious detrimental effects like any other drug. Highlighting that constant usage of this online drug does not increase self-esteem, but rather lowers it. This is also being observed with the consistent consumption of other worldwide online communication vehicles. Is this because these worldwide online tools are being utilized for what the world promotes rather than what the scriptures promote? Could we imagine how much better the world would be if we utilized these worldwide online communication vehicles just for what the scripture supports and promotes as compared to what the world actually supports and promotes. Thankfully, the Messiah, Yahushua, knew this would happen as he stated that people who were not loving towards his father and his way, but rather just wanted to be nice, would not come to him to possess life. As Yahushua made it clear he did not receive esteem from men. Because he knew those who desire to be liked by supporting and promoting what the world does did not have the love of his Father in them. The Messiah, Yahushua, further shared that he came in his Father's name and that those in this world would not receive him in that name. And why world history has proven everything else has been accepted, but not the name which is above all names. And the Messiah, Yahushua, clarifies that the esteem that is from the Almighty One, the world does not seek, because the world is more interested in getting likes, which is nothing more than esteem from each other, rather than the esteem from the Almighty One Himself. Is this why very few confess who the Messiah is? And why many fall for anything in this world? True love is indeed about loyalty. If we do indeed love the Messiah, Yahushua, we shall guard his word. And as such, the Almighty Father in heaven will love us too. And as such, they will make their stay with us. Because... 
He who does not love the Messiah, Yahushua, does not guard his words. So, what we promote and our support does indeed clarify if we are loving and or just being nice. It should come as no surprise then that a simple etymological search for the origins of the word nice reveals that 500 years ago when the word nice was first used in English, it meant foolish and or stupid. This is not surprising as it may seem since it came through early French from the Latin necius, meaning ignorant. So, are we loving or just nice? Based on what we support and or promote? Or is the world today just foolish and stupid, let alone ignorant, just like other past societies that crumbled into decay and demise as they struggled with the basics of being loving or just nice. This brings us to the final category of this scriptural study video on why scriptural love is more beneficial. There are reasons why many study history in order to recognize why nations and empires rise and fall all in the same manner throughout the ages and why there is no coincidence that the scripture records that what has been is what shall be, what has been done is what shall be done, and as such, there is no new matter under the sun. In fact, historians have recognized eight consistent stages of the rise and fall of empires throughout the millennia. Stage one is when a new society recognizes they are in the bondage of lawlessness or chaos. Only the scripture recognizes the cause of lawlessness, which produces chaos in our world. History provides another great example in which even the U.S. recognized this at their start as well and utilized only parts of the scripture to ensure a proper spirit to secure the foundation of their new empire. In 1384, John Wycliffe, in his scriptural translation, wrote, quote, The scripture is for the government, for the people, by the people, and for the people. End of quote. Sound familiar? It should. Indeed, bondage is lawlessness, and all new empires realize the need for spiritual growth at their start. Just like General MacArthur realized after World War II that if humankind was to survive moving forward, the solution must come from the spirit if we were to save the flesh. The missing link is the Ten Commandments because it is this spiritual truth that produces the scriptural fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustworthiness, gentleness, and self-control. And why being loving and or just nice determines what we promote and or support. Because... History has proven that spiritual growth leads to great courage in serving each other scripturally and thus spiritually, which leads to true freedom and abundance. But, regrettably, nice people abound. And as horrifying as this is, find ways to legalize lawlessness through their elected politicians, which in turn can and does move a nation and or empire from abundance to complacency and then to apathy, filled with impassiveness and indifference, which leads 
to dependence on what the world promotes. And ultimately back to the final death blow of bondage, which is nothing more than self-love that failed the Greeks as they decided in being nice with their approach to the bondage of the ten ways of the world. Just like the U.S. and many other countries are in process of doing now. Rather than promoting and or supporting the spiritual love that Scripture provides to serve and love others. But, hallelujah, we all can take heart because the Messiah, Yahushua, has overcome the world. And why we all now can overcome this world in order to be set apart from it. Because the Messiah, Yahushua, shared with us that Moshe wrote about him and the Ten Commandments. No, the prophets nor the Messiah spoke and or wrote about how to be nice. They spoke and wrote about how to be separated from the world, didn't they? So, whether you are a believer and are not a believer of Scripture, the challenge exposes us all. Are we loving or just nice? We continue to pray in the name which is above all names that these scriptural study videos provide value for you and your loved ones. Until next time, Yahuwah willing, all the best in the name which is above all names.